Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Julia Bennett. I'm the um, co-director of the Green Register. And thank you for joining us for our Twilight Talk today. So in a moment, I'll be handing over to our speaker, Julia. But before I do that, I'll just do a few bits of housekeeping, just in case there's anyone who's unfamiliar with the way things go in our events. Um, whilst the speaker is on, please mute your microphone. Uh, you can use the little microphone icon at the bottom left hand side of the toolbar on Zoom. And if you would like to leave your video on, it's always nice for our speakers to see their audience. So it's up to you as your choice. You can turn it off if you'd like, but we'd love to be able to see you. In Zoom, there's a little button at the bottom in the toolbar called chat, which has got a little um, speech bubble beside it. And in that, you can write questions that occur to you as we go along. And we will be monitoring that. So if anybody has any points for immediate clarification, we'll sort those out as we go. Otherwise, we'll be collect we'll be looking through all of the chat and doing questions and answers at the end. If you do have any technical issues while we're going through and you've still got a link on Zoom, then you can go into the chat and send a message to tech support. You can select who it is you're sending the message to. And my lovely colleague, Sarah, who is here with us tonight, will see what she can do to help you. So let's get started. Our speaker tonight is Julia Koslick uh, from the Programme for the Endorsement of Forest Certification, which we all say PEFC for short. Um, she joined PEFC in 2017 to focus on driving the awareness to market players about sustainable forest management and its benefits for climate, biodiversity and people. But her real main focus at the moment is that she leads the PEFC International Textile Programme. And we're going to hear about this. It's, and she spends a lot of time helping fashion brands understand the opportunities uh, in man-made fibres made from plants. They're called cellulosic fibres. Um, as you can tell, that comes from the cellular and the cellulose uh, words. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Julia. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Julia. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you a lot for having me. And hello, everyone. Uh, so bear with me for a second. I will start sharing my screen. Go. All right. Um, so at the moment, we've got the speaker presentation, Julia. Yes, here we go. So it should be all fine. That's so, perfect. Uh, thank you. Great, great, great. So thank you very much uh, for joining the session today. So I will be talking about forest positive sourcing. Um, and I will bring the examples of uh, fashion industry and the challenges uh, they faced and, uh, you know, different um, drivers uh, for, uh, yeah, moving to responsible sourcing or looking into forest-based uh, fibers and materials. I will also explain a bit uh, about the sustainable forest management and what elements it entails. Uh, then we we'll speak about traceability, so what Again, was a challenge there in the fashion industry. And I would also bring some examples from the construction and compare uh, the two a bit. And then at the end, uh, I think Julia mentioned, we will have also time for your questions. But please feel free. If there's any clarification needed, you know, yeah, put it on the chat and I hope Julia will let me know. <laughs> Great. So uh, just before uh, I would like to briefly say, uh, uh, who PFC is. So we are a global non-for-profit, non-governmental organization uh, founded in 1999. Uh, first, it was uh, really for the smallholders, small, uh, smallholders uh, uh, of the forest owners, forest uh, operators. But today uh, we work with uh, different sizes from small to mid-size to large uh, uh, forest, uh, forest companies or forest uh, ownerships. Uh, we are global, so we are present in nearly 50 countries. Uh, what we do um, through multi-stakeholder process, we set international standards. Uh, we also work with national forest certification systems and make sure 
they are all aligned to the global benchmark. Um, and we have, let's say, as certifications, there are two most known ones. It's sustainable forest management, and it is a chain of custody certification, which is for uh, supply chain companies, basically, when material leaves the forest. Uh, in terms of countries, as I mentioned, nearly 50 countries uh, covering 200 uh, 88 million hectares uh, are using these standards, representing 71% share in global certified forest areas. And in terms of chain of custody certifications, so the companies who then source uh, different forest derived materials, it's about 22,000 companies, again, uh, presented globally, who use then uh, uh, this certification to uh, source their materials, trade materials, verify the origin of the materials. Um, let's start uh, with a short poll to you, uh, to the audience. So in a moment, you'll see the poll uh, activated on your screen. There will be two questions uh, for you. I think you can answer one uh, and then straight away the second one. I don't know, is it already on the screens? Uh, don't see it. <laughs> bear with me a second. Yes. Okay, so the first question. Uh, right, will, um, yes, here we go. First question, to your knowledge, uh, how is the use of timber in the building construction uh, perceived? Three options, uh, positive, neutral, negative. Can you, can you see that on the screen, everybody? I just saw it very briefly and then it disappeared. Yes, it's... Uh, okay, it's, it's back again. Sorry, it's... It needs to reset because that's got, or unless people have already put results in, have they? I'm saying it's ended. Sarah, are you there? I just want to, oh, there we go. Relaunch the poll. You got it? I think so. Okay. Yeah, there you go. go. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I guess we were restarting, right? So please, everyone, <laughs> so, <laughs> again, so we can see what, what's, yeah. And then I guess you can straight away go to the second question, which is, again, to your knowledge, what are the main perceived factors for not using timber in building construction? You can select all uh, all the options that that you that apply. So we'll leave a few seconds. And then I guess uh, Julia or Sarah, could you help us see the results? Yes, hopefully. Oh, why is it not doing that? Perhaps I have to come out of it. Do you have to end poll and then share the results? Yes, you're right, I do. All right, here we go. So uh, that's uh, your answers uh, for the first question. So 83% of you uh, feel like the general use of timber construction is positive. Um, can we see it? I'll just see if I can get, there we go. Now people can vote. Okay, so for the second Probably. question, please <laughs> go ahead and vote. So for what uh, are the main perceived factors for not using timber? in uh, building construction. You can select any, uh, as many as you feel are required. Oh. So the options here, fire safety, uh, techn other technical factors, I'm sure there are many, uh, environmental concerns, aesthetics, uh, building regulations, costs. Okay, has everyone who wants to vote had a vote? Still? Still twitching a little bit, but we'll end the poll there. Yeah, let's see. Let's find the needed results. Okay, fire safety. Yes, the most important one. Technical factors, other technical factors, 52%. Interesting. So if we can pause uh, here for a second. So that's, uh, of course, it's a, a small sample. Uh, but as I understand, uh, all of you, uh, one way or another, are uh, construction built environment professionals. So if we were uh, to ask similar poll to uh, fashion industry players, I think the top one and by far would be environmental concern. 
it's environmental concern, but I guess it will be like your fire uh, safety concern. It will be really the most important element uh, that the fashion industry is considering when sourcing for its direct materials. So they are hugely concerned uh, about the environment, about the impact that it may have on the forest whenever they used forest fibers for the clothes. That's what um, we can uh, close the view. So it's very interesting how the perception is different from one sector to another. Um, also, if we look into the um, <clears throat> uh, the customers, so the end consumers uh, of fashion brands, that's also is uh, we're actually gonna uh, do uh, some uh, more consumer studies on that, but from different sources that we see, it's also one of the main concerns. This is all also the perception from the general, let's say, fashion consumers that, uh, you know, using wood materials uh, is somehow linked to environmental issues uh, and challenges. So here we go. Uh, for the fashion industry, they're really highly concerned about potential environmental risks to the forest. So biodiversity is there really Key priority, climate change, uh, deforestation. I think we've heard qu also quite a bit about deforestation in the context of uh, EU uh, deforestation regulation. Uh, then also the risk around uh, water and soil health. So here you really see whenever fashion brands are talking or considering uh, use of forest materials, these are the key uh, concerns they have. Uh, and also these are the key, if they start implementing any uh, programs or policies that would be or targets that would be around those uh, subjects. Very different uh, the construction industry. Uh, and so uh, to address that, um, because there, um, there are different elements, so we wanted really to look into it. So what are the risks? Uh, so you see we identified these risks uh, that uh, the fashion stakeholders are really concerned about. But then we looked into the country specific because also the forest and the forest challenges, the forest context is very different from country to country, but even within the country, they can differ. So we really looked into the supply chain, where is the forest sourcing locations and how uh, this risk can be mitigated, but actually also practically uh, addressed in a way that uh, more forest benefits are created. So if you're interested, there are some uh, fashion specific elements in that white paper, but there are some and things that I will cover today uh, in a broad uh, general sense about forests. So I invite you to download uh, and read the paper. But I will uh, show you a bit of uh, some highlights. So one of the key elements, uh, of course, that we look into is sustainable forest management. And we look to which extent sustainable forest management can uh, mitigate these risks. So what is sustainable forest management? Just uh, some definitions from uh, FAO, from UN institution. It's uh, it's an approach which aims to maintain and enhance uh, so three pillars of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental values. So it's about the balance uh, of these three. Um, and it's also looking into the present, the benefits for the present and also for the future. So it's today and tomorrow. Uh, so there are different uh, elements into it, but it's about forests and trees. Uh, and looking into their contribution to the people, to the planet, to the sustainable livelihoods, clean water, biodiversity, climate change. So that's the concept. And then looking into particular elements, uh, I think we have something in the chat. Is there something we want to pause and address? I think it's okay. There was somebody who was asking, oh. what's, what's the <laughs> difference between PFC and PEFC? Uh, <laughs> and there's lots of people helping helping with a PFC, which uh, I'm not too sure whether we're being serious, but don't worry, carry on. <laughs> okay. All right. So if we look into uh, one of the top uh, concerns that the fashion uh, sector has about biodiversity, loss of biodiversity. Um, so, of course, biodiversity is really important for the forest. So forests are home to more than... 80% of all uh, terrestrial species, animal, plants, and insects. So it's really important hub uh, for biodiversity. Also, there's we, we know that there are threatened and endangered species, so they're still present. So 
and many of them in the forest. So of course the concern uh, is valid, uh, but if we look to sustainable forest management and you know all the different forestry standards, they all aim, uh, so kind of the paramount um, rules is to, of course, the protection of threatened and endangered species, so prohibition of any exploitation of those, um, but also there are some proactive measures to enhance biodiversity. Uh, so things like planting different tree species, planting in terms of, yeah, there are different kind of trees, but there are also, for example, different uh, heights of trees, you know, that grow at different space because of different, uh, at different tree heights, let's say, or different heights, you'll have different biodiversity elements growing and living. Uh, things like leaving some uh, of the uh, timber residues on the ground would be also beneficial uh, to the biodiversity. So all these elements are really, really a uh, paramount part uh, of the sustainable forest management. Uh, then another element is climate change mitigation uh, and climate change in general. So, of course, forests uh, play an important role, uh, like trees, they absorb carbon, um, they produce uh, oxygen, but also trees as a forest uh, ecosystem uh, is important to, uh, plays an important role in uh, regulating uh, the climate, uh, in uh, regulating the temperatures. It's really important that we keep the amount of forest, but also the quality of forest that they continue uh, to do uh, the important work uh, they've been doing. So forests themselves are also impacted quite a lot by climate change. So all this extreme weather is uh, uh, too hot. So you have uh, forest fires, you have different uh, insects or uh, pests that are happening in the forest that are really impacting and negatively many of that. Uh, is is uh, as a result of climate change. So therefore, again, it's really important that there are proactive planning in the forest because, you know, trees, they, they have that life cycle. Of course, it's very long. Uh, if we look at, for example, European forests, but still there is a life cycle. So whenever um, the forest operators, they plan what type of trees they're going to plant, but uh, yes, they need to look to... Uh, maintain the tree balance they have currently, but also to think what tree species are most likely to survive in the next 20, 30 years. So the forest will not degradate, will not die. Uh, so those are important elements of sustainable forest management, really to consider how you make your forest most adapted and resilient to the climate change and to the changing climate conditions. Also, it's really important uh, maybe if, uh, if you were following a bit of EUDR, um, there it's not only the deforestation, but it's about forest degradation. Because when we have forest degradation, uh, then yeah, the ecosystem, forest ecosystem become more vulnerable. Um, there could be things like uh, exceeded floods uh, around the forest because the, uh, the forests uh, are not capable uh, to the sufficient level to regulate the water, or there could be desertification. Loss of the forest is only uh, uh, increasing. So that those are really important um, things. So sustainable forest management really helps to contribute uh, to proactively making forest ecosystems more resilient. And just some uh, kind of uh, quick facts, uh, a tree on average, absorbs about uh, 150 kilograms of CO2 every year, equivalent of 600 kilometers of uh, car journey. And if we look, for example, in the amount of uh, forest areas that we have under PFC uh, managed, uh, according to PFC Sustainable Forest Management Standards, uh, it's roughly equivalent to 85% of UK's annual emissions. So yes. <laughs> We need more uh, sustainable forests, uh, man sustainably managed forests. We need more forests to help keep up uh, with all uh, the uh, carbon footprint uh, we're having. So now looking into deforestation, a really important topic uh, as now companies uh, will be uh, large uh, operators in EU uh, 
putting products on EU market will be asked to demonstrate uh, the proof that there have been no uh, deforestation in the products they're trading on the EU market. Uh, so, but regardless of that, of course, deforestation is uh, driving uh, zero deforestation is very important. Deforestation in where there is a conversion of forest to non-forest land or degradation is when the forest is degraded. Um, so, um, one of another key elements of sustainable forest management is to maintain forests as forests and to prevent that forests are converted to other land, uh, land use. Uh, many things can be done within the forest, but also it has to work in collaboration with other sectors. As we know, in many, uh, what, about what, 70 to 80% of deforestation, if we look back, uh, has been driven by different agricultural factors, so agriculture expansion, cattle. Um, so, of course, it's important not just to, so there is important to uh, consider socioeconomic factors. So if we're looking into uh, developing uh, countries where, uh, you know, communities solely depend on, on this area, uh, and if uh, you say, okay, you can't convert it to, uh, to do your soil plantations or I don't know animal ranching, so forest you need to maintain it. The forest, so forest needs to be also part of their social economic. Uh, so the, the, it needs to provide some sort of uh, livelihoods. So here, uh, different products out of the forest are very important. I will maybe skip the next one: yeah, clean water and air. Uh, so soil, uh, also no use of harmful pesticides. This is uh, very important, and sustainable forest management looks very carefully after that. But forests are more than just environmental uh, pillars. Uh, so forests are also very important for people. Around 25% of global uh, populations, 1.6 billion people, rely on forests for their livelihoods, employment, income. As I said, there should be some sustainable solution for them to use forests sustainably. Um, and if we look into extreme poor, 40% uh, of extreme poor uh, populations live in forests and savanna areas. So really uh, very uh, dependent on, on forests. And uh, therefore, um, sustainable forest management needs to uh, acknowledge, consider, and include uh, indigenous groups, respect indigenous uh, people's rights, include them in uh, at least the decision making to provide them access to forests, and because in some countries uh, you would have private forests and uh, private uh, forest owners, let's say, have a right to their private land. Uh, but uh, with sustainable forest management and certification, they would need to provide access to uh, local communities, to indigenous communities, to those forests to practice maybe their traditional, I don't know, firewood ga uh, gathering or. Uh, I don't know, gathering of berries, medicines in that forest. In many countries, oh, that's, uh, sorry, <laughs> I will uh, move on. And also, as I said, it's uh, a lot of people are employed in forests. So it's formally, it's 33 million of people, but it's said that there's actually the figure, uh, it's uh, a very uh uh, shyest, I mean, there are more people employed around the world in forests, but even that represents 1% of the global employment. So in sustainable forest management, green jobs, safe and fair working conditions are also integral part. So people that work in the forest they must be trained, they ha must have uh, the correct equipment, there should be no discrimination for fair wages, or discrimination for gender, or for migrant workers. So those all those elements have to be in place uh, to ensure that uh, it's a safe uh, and fair place of work. So as I said, uh, you can uh, download the paper to read more about all these elements. Uh, and, and here we just picked up the topics that are the most important for the fashion uh, sector to demonstrate what can be done. Uh, because yes, they have a fair concerns that those elements might happen to the forest but then uh, it's all about what uh, you proactively, what solutions uh, you bring in. Uh, so yeah, sustainable forest management 
is a forest positive approach that provides long-term environmental, social, and economic benefits and contributes to various um, uh, yeah, to, to various uh, elements that you see here. I will just quickly. Okay. Uh, yes, maybe we'll take that uh, comment in in the chat later on. If I see it. Okay. Uh, if we look at the fashion, you might wonder. Okay, we've heard uh, Julia very quickly uh, introduced about uh, fibers, uh, but. Actually, how, how much does it represent in the fashion sector? So man-made cellulose fibers, uh, with MMCF, which are mostly like 90, almost, almost 99% are wood-derived fiber. So it's a viscose lyocell modal acetate. You can see those textiles most probably in your wardrobes. So they represent, uh, 6.4% of the global, uh, textile fiber basket. You might think, oh, that's not that big. Yeah, because the largest one is synthetics, 62%, uh, cotton, 23%. Uh, but at the same time, look, wool is just 1%. And for sure, all of you have <laughs> at least one woolen item. So just to give you, because the fashion industry is quite high in volume, so they're wood-based fibers. Uh, yeah, six times more than uh, wool uh, fibers in the textile fiber basket. And then uh, also just uh, give you a little bit of idea. So how does it work? So uh, you have wood, then it's then uh, turned into dissolving wood pulp. Uh, and then dissolving wood pulp material quite close to the pulp that you would be producing, for example, paper packaging. But here it's a higher grade uh, of the pulp, so dissolving wood pulp. And then it, uh, from that you can produce, again, in a specialized uh, production, you can do a uh, meme cellulosic fibers, either viscose modal, lyocell, acetate. And then from there, uh, they can be spun into textiles. The garments can be made. Uh, so if you look at, it's a bit different, difficult to map the meme cellulosic fibers. So important when we want to understand where it's sourced, it's usually sourced around the dissolving wood pulp production facilities. So these are the countries, uh, mostly. Uh, it's China, by far, is the largest uh, source, then USA, South Africa, Canada, Indonesia. Uh, so, yes, uh, coming back to the uh, perceptions about using wood and its, uh, and any concerns uh, to, to the environment uh, factors, yes, fashion uh, industry, uh, rightfully so, uh, is, is conscious about does, if I source, uh, if I ha use, uh, forest derived materials, my mesolithic fibers in my collection, do I contribute, uh, to any, uh, known deforestation, any known of, uh, uh, loss of biodiversity? Uh, so therefore we are really happy that they ask all these questions and we can, uh, work with them, uh, to, to, to really see how they uh, how it's addressed and how it's mitigated. Again, another interesting thing to look at um, is that there's the solving wood pulp that will later go to uh, the textile fibers represents just under three percent uh, of the overall round wood uh, removal. So every year, there's X amount uh, of round wood is harvested from the forest. Just under three percent would go into the solving pulp, um, and when we uh, compare it, so I actually did a slide to compare it uh, to the uh, wood that is then using uh, used for construction. Uh, here, yes, <laughs> definitely much higher volume. Uh, again, it's a rough estimation, so it's about forty-four to fifty-five percent of the round annual round wood removals estimated to go into different products that then will be part of the uh, construction uh, industry, so to use into building construction. Again, it could be very different product. It could be from, I don't know, uh, mass timber to, I don't know, songbu panels, um, fiberboard. And then the remaining one, you, you'd wonder what the, the rest of the wood is uh, usually used. So it's uh, paper packaging, uh, 
and there is also smaller share for uh, firewood. So in a lot of uh, uh, remote location firewood is still one of the main uh, source uh, for, for energy uh, in most in all remote locations. Um, all right, so what uh, is this kind of, uh, how uh, we, we work with uh, fashion brands, apparel uh, brands. So yes, risk mitigation uh, is the key. So you, you have to mitigate uh, at the forest level, but at the same time, they, their supply chain and the brands themselves are really so far remote from the forest. They, they, they don't own forests or they don't even source directly from the forest. So yes, they want it to happen, but how do they make the link? So they need to have some uh, transparency supply chain. They need to know how their supply chain goes. Uh, they, uh, they need traceability, right? They need uh, mechanisms how to trace the fibers from the forest to the garment. And uh, the solution, yeah, it needs to be solid, so it needs to be robust, but it also needs to be scalable. So you need to verify it, but in a scalable way. And as the supply chains are quite global, so it should be applicable across different countries. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this is the supply chain rough <laughs> uh, schematic of the uh, fashion supply chain, which is quite complex. So first, uh, for, for the man-made cellulosic fiber, so you have a forest, then yeah, uh, sawmill, uh, then you have dissolving wood pulp, you have fiber, yarn, uh, textile production, then garment, and roughly around the yarn production. It's also where the yarn producer can be spinning uh, very different fibers. So it will be not only man-made cellulose fiber. So they will be work working with cotton as well, you know, with, yeah, with, so with, with different fibers. So here again, uh, there's becoming less focus on, on forest product. They, you, you don't really see it as a forest product. It looks just yarn. It looks like a cotton yarn, uh, like a, a viscous yarn. Uh, uh, polyester yarn. They roughly, of course, there are some technical specificities, but visually, you don't even identify it as a as a forest product anymore. So again, it all gets uh, mixed mixed in the supply chain, and it's uh, there's limited visibility. So chain of custody is really one of the solutions that is already available uh, in other sectors, widely used in other sectors. Uh, that uh, we propose could be also adopted um, by by the fashion industry. Uh, so what is important? What does it bring? Uh, so it's uh, you can trace and verify the region of your feedstock. So at each step separately. Uh, so each uh, supplier takes their responsibility to do that um, with a third party verification. Uh, for brands' perspective, they can easily identify and then make those sourcing decisions uh, that we want to source from the forests that are sustainably managed so they can identify the products that derive from those sustainably managed forests. Um, another thing that is increasing the importance is green claims. It's uh, another legislation that's about, even without that, it's about substantiated claims. It's about, yeah, uh, really not having any greenwashing and being able to really clearly uh, 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 communicate uh, to your customers, uh, and it's about uh, for many brands they they need to set targets uh, for their stakeholders, for their investors, for for their shareholders. Uh, and sustainability are also uh, becoming increasingly important. So uh, this way they can very easily set their targets on let's say non safe sourcing. And they can track the progress uh, because it's usually yeah it works on there should be a very clear claim about what's the content, what's the percentage uh, of certified material that they receive, and that is has been uh, verified by the third party auditor. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a lot of challenges and barriers, and uh, we've worked, I think, over five years now uh, with, yeah, with many, many brands, but we've seen already some positive shifts and examples. So even though that the brands themselves, they start to understand that uh, it's not only just about risks, but it's about actually I can source forest materials and by sourcing forest materials from sustainable managed forest, I'm creating some positive manifests from the forest, from other communities. So they became more um, 
confident also on communicating it. So even at the consumer facing uh, reports of web pages, we could see quite big global brands uh, start to communicate about what are their targets, what are their ambitions, what are their policies. Uh, so here I just uh, put a few. Uh, so it's kind of a journey also to educate the consumer that yes, this is a forest product and this is actually a good thing. <laughs> um, for example, here Farfetch is a, a e-commerce retailer. This is kind of on a higher end uh, uh, products and they are in a product description. Almost in every page they have uh, information about products or certifications or some additional paragraph about uh, the material. And they, they speak very clearly that this is from forest, for example, this, uh, this dress. Another one uh, is, yeah, uh, Fendi is quite a uh, known brand, which communicates about where they are at today and uh, where they want to be. Uh, so here they have their uh, 2023 target. So those are positive examples uh, that are moving forward. And if we look at the construction of and see uh, just maybe five more minutes and then we'll, we'll go to the questions. So in construction, uh, actually you're in a much better, <laughs> uh, easy, uh, I'd say you're well, uh, better positioned. First of all, supply chain is, um, you may, some might say it's complex, but still a bit less uh, complex than maybe fashion supply chain. There's more visibility. Also the product itself is more visible, you clearly can see. That's a wood based, uh, forest uh, based material. Uh, also, usually, you know, the producers that would do, I don't know, CLT or fiber, they would spe you know, specialize on the wood based product. They won't have like a plastic product and, I don't know, steel product. Uh, so they can really focus and they really dedicate themselves into understanding their sourcing. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of the supply chain is a bit shorter. Here I simplified a bit that you have uh, you, you you harvest timber, then it goes into a producer that will produce, let's say, CLT, and then it goes to the house. Now, most probably it goes to a trader or it goes to a wholesaler or retailer, I guess more for a fiber board. And then uh, you can, you can uh, construct uh, a building from that. So it's quite shorter. You have visibility on the product. Uh, so that also creates better connection with the product. So that would be also one of my um, kind of uh, suggestion of why there is such a big difference from, if you remember the poll, uh, the first question in the poll, why the perception of using wood is so different. I feel like maybe because this um, industry, the fashion industry, are much further removed from the forest. They don't really work with wood. Uh, they don't see wood, the forest is so far away that they really have, um, they're much more careful. They have more, um, sometimes they have misconceptions. Uh, sometimes, yeah, there is really a gap in knowledge or awareness or understanding of real challenges or benefits. Um, that's why there's really such a big uh, concern about environment where the industry that works with wood, we saw that it works in a much higher volume, uh, kind of knows <laughs> in a way a bit more about forest uh, realities and um, and situation. It has more trust in forest products. Uh, so for, for your industry, in a way, chain of custody is also applicable mechanism for, for products uh, themselves. So the products uh, can also uh, use the certification to verify where, where they come from and they, they can have the claims. But there is also another uh, specific uh, solution uh, to the construction industry is the project certification. Again, to address this element where some products might be certified because the project is complex. I would imagine you have so many different products and elements, suppliers. So here... Um, uh, it, it, it allows, uh, yeah, to just calculate what's the overall percentage of certified materials used, uh, in that project or timber products as, uh, used in that project, uh, project and the auditor to be able to verify that. And then, uh, the, the, the product, uh, the project, the building 
uh, will be able to have uh, some sort of claims about what the percentage of timber there was sourced from sustainably managed forests. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. We, we we have actually some materials. If you're interested, let me know about project certification. And here in this uh, sector, so in your sector, we already see quite uh, a lot of adoption. So I see. Um, so here are just a few some examples of project certification. Actually, quite a lot in UK. Uh, already back in 2012, we had uh, project certification for the Olympic Stadium. Uh, so there's residential buildings, there are office buildings, uh, there are public buildings like libraries uh, that are using uh, these uh, certifications. And in terms of materials, again, in the construction space, you can find much more companies who are manufacturing different construction materials from timber and they already have uh, certifications so they can provide this. Uh, evidence that they're sourcing from sustainable managed forest. Yet still, <laughs> we found that, uh, as I said, maybe uh, the supply chain is complex, uh, but at the same time, um, or maybe less complex, but at the same time, there are quite a lot of decision makers uh, in, in construction, especially if we speak about yeah, large scale uh, construction. So you have, uh, yeah, you have a client, but sometimes it's, yeah, it's a huge company. You can have architects, you have the uh, construction companies, yeah, contractors. So there's lots of different things and there are different level of understanding there, maybe. <laughs> and we realized that, um, architects, uh, had quite a lot of misconceptions about forests, but that was, some years ago. And we also did uh, some programs. Uh, it was not me, it was uh, my colleagues uh, that were in charge uh, of introducing the, with the World Ar Architecture Festival for two years. Uh, so we introduced the prize called uh, the Best Use of a Certified Timber Prize, really to promote among architects and to consider uh, uh, constructing the wood, but also considering that, okay, it comes from sustainably managed forests. Uh, so that was one uh, of the program we did. And the second one was on uh, more of a social media of uh, myth and truth. Uh, there is a lot of myth uh, uh, as or a lot of concerns or kind of things that people want to know more about fire safety, uh, yeah, how durable are those buildings. So we, we've done uh, the campaign about myth uh, and truth in, in, about timber uh, construction. I think it was one of the most reshared and and yeah engaging uh, social media campaign we had. Uh, all right, so yeah, I, talk, I covered uh, that that in construction you have plenty of uh, products uh, with forest certifications in general. Um, so very quickly, I mean that's mostly recommendations we do for fashion brands, but I think some of it is is relevant for you as well. It's procurement sourcing policy. It's really what are you asking from your uh, suppliers? I'm sure you, are, you have a lot of uh, uh, specifications, but uh, one of the things to consider is if you're using timber products, uh, should they come also with, with the forest certification? Uh, as uh, I saw quickly on the chat, so of course there are two uh, main global forest certifications, so it's PFC and FSC. So we are uh, very much um, supporting the inclusive approach that you should ask for both of the more of national certification systems. So uh, that promotes also inclusivity for the forest owners. Uh, then it's about, yeah, asking maybe your current suppliers already have certification and they just didn't, uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't offer you certified products or it's about working with your suppliers and seeing if they can obtain it. Uh, so especially it will be more, more and more increasingly important with the EU DR. And I guess there will be also some sort of UK timber reg deforestation regulation coming in um, if you're placing products in, in the UK market. Then it's about also communication, communicate your targets, your timelines. So maybe you can't switch on day one. But uh, yeah, uh, explain what's your timeline expectation. Maybe help them to direct them to the materials. And if you are a large company, uh, and I would imagine, yeah, can I have like so many different suppliers and yeah, so many different products? 
can get get complicated and keep track. Uh, there are also a way to connect, you know, the database to more easily see the update of the status of the suppliers if they're certified, if their certification is still valid. There are these API seamless uh, connection between databases. Right, so I think here I close with my slide. Uh, implement forest positive sourcing to ensure the long term vitality of our forests and well being of forest communities. That would be my key message. Um, so let's uh, start with questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. There was an awful lot to absorb there. Um, <laughs> so, a couple of our questions in the chat that we can pick up. Um, the difference, what are the different, uh, the differences in certification with the Forest Stewardship Council and uh, PEFC? And when I first trained, uh, FSC was the one that was always promoted because PEFC was the Pan-European Forestry Council. Yes. And it, it, was, it was seen as a lesser uh, standard to the Forestry Stewardship Certification Scheme. Um, so how have things changed? Obviously, PEFC is now a completely different acronym. Are there are there many differentiating points between certifying with you or with FSC? Yes, so uh, yes, definitely we've grown from just pan-European, so we became global, hence as a change of the name program or endorsement of forest certification. So today we are the, the, the largest in the forest area. So if you look at the forest uh also, I guess one of the main difference uh, will be how we govern and develop the system and work with the stakeholders. I think that, that will be a, a bit of a difference. I mean, there is no one best approach, but we strongly believe in ours. And I think we need both to, to advance sustainable forest management globally because only 11% uh, of forests globally are certified to either PFC or FSC. So there's yeah. still a lot of work to do. But how we work uh, is we work through national certification, so national standards. Uh, as the forests are so diverse and we recognize it, it since the beginning, we said, okay, we're going to set a very clear criteria. What is the minimum global uh, benchmark, global expectation? Then what are the rules for developing and engaging with uh, stakeholders locally? And then uh, the local uh, governing bodies, PFC governing bodies, with the local stakeholders, then then need to convene through the working groups, public consultations, and develop the additional national uh, criteria, which are specific to their country, to their environmental context or social context. Um, and then that's kind of a very clear process that we said we want to to build the system uh, from the beginning. Uh, it was a bit different for FSC. But now we see they actually have also quite a lot of national standards, not just one global standard as they used to have before. Uh, I would say that's the main difference. If we look at the comparison of what actually the standards say, even if you look at the PSC benchmark standard, global standards, so the lowest denominator, um, various, even the UK procurement, uh, I don't remember what was the name. Uh, so there was a U UK public procurement uh, body that uh, was tasked to do the assessment so they would be able to make a, a decision on their procurement policy and they found that the two of the standards uh, are very close so yeah the, the points were super close uh, what, what we are asked before so it's about how we engage with stakeholders that we have a continuous working groups not just at an international level but at all the countries we operate uh, we have data standards every five years in global, and each international standard is updated after that. Uh, and that should be only done with the uh, national uh, working groups. And so always in consultation and in, uh, engagement with the... So it's in a way, it puts more work <laughs> for, for the stakeholders. They need yeah. to be engaged. It's not just that they take the list and they implement it. They need to be uh, actively participative. That's why maybe we are moving a bit slowlier in some countries, but we believe that's the effort. When you engage them, they they'll be more. They will really start, uh, yeah, be part of it, and they will be more eager to adopt it. Uh, but on the market, it's a bit different. Yes, uh, FSC has more um, is more seen. Let's say they they have uh, yeah a bigger marketing uh, efforts. 
Well, I think also that back in the day they were the one that was known in the UK, and they were uh, they were mentioned in things like the Green Guide to Specification and things like that. I think we've moved on a lot from there, and you're quite right. We need as many forestry certification schemes as it takes to increase the amount of chain of custody approach as possible. I'm going to move on to a question now, which is talking about the processing of the dissolved dissolving wood pulp and how that is turned turned from the wood itself into the pulp and then from the pulp into the fibres. There's a question about whether there are chemicals used and what where where those chemicals come from. And uh, obviously there's quite a bit, I assume there's quite a bit of water involved in the process as well. Uh, yes. Uh, so as it's yeah, man-made cellulosic fiber, so it's manufactured uh, in, in a way I, I can speak a, a little bit to it, but in a way it's like outside of the scope of forest certification. So we're really looking into the forests, yeah. uh, what chemicals of what water is used in the forest. So when it co- goes to production, uh, indeed uh, they are they use chemicals, uh, they use water, uh, but uh, now more and more um, there are uh, different innovations uh, in those uh, factories where they actually have a uh, closed loop system. It's similar to uh, to the innovation uh, trajectory that the paper and packaging industry has went, where they it's like a biorefinery where they use the residuals of the pulp to uh, to for, for the energy, and then you know the the water is then used for cooling. So yes, there's it, as, uh, in some countries of the world, is still challenging, uh, but there are um, other s- uh, dedicated organizations working on that. Uh, just to name a few, there is a ZDHC, uh, there is a Greenpeace that's looking in particular chemical management standard. But I think overall, fashion industry needs uh, some closer look into chemical use mm. and and water use because yes, for production you you might need, but there are many other textile fibers, the fabrics in, in general, like for example, denim, it uses quite a lot of water mm-hmm. um, that yeah, needs to be more reg- regulated ideally, but uh, at least there should be some uh, corporate commitments into better practices. Thank you, Julia. Um, so Chin Tan is asking, is saying, in the light of the greenwashing of carbon credits with many audit companies also, uh, he's dropped in an article about um, some cracks that have been identified in the FSC certification. And he says, you know, how aware are you of these and what is PEFC doing to mitigate them with your certification process? Yes. So first, <laughs> and I guess the key element is we haven't had a carbon credit project because that's, as I said, there is a lot of elements to consider so it's very complex so because it's easy to sign up credits and you know companies think everything is good uh but in reality it might not <laughs> so I, I i'm thank you for sharing their article i'll have a look maybe I've, I've read that uh but yes that could be challenging that's why we are not uh doing carbon credits right um because the, the elements which is important is not just replanting the trees. You know, we replanted that many trees. Is to consider would those trees is it the right type of trees? Is it the right place where you're planting them? Um, will they survive? Would, would that be a resilient forest ecosystem? That's one. Um, but also the second element is just stepping out and say, hey, uh, is it uh, carbon credits? So kind of trying to buy back your carbon is it the best approach or should we look into actually minimizing our carbon uh, footprint to begin with yes i would i would agree with that but thank you for um picking up on that that really is a significant discerning factor between you and fsc if uh, if carbon credits are not something that you use i think that would make a difference to quite a lot of our green register members that that uh, you're less uh, open to greenwashing, which I think was the point Chin Tan was making. Yeah, but also to be fair, I think FSC did it in in uh, collaboration with Vera, and Vera was in charge of 
uh, the carbon credit accounting and all of that. So I wouldn't just I wouldn't just put a blame on FSC. Uh, yes, uh, so I want to be yes. Yeah, good good point to be made there. We don't want to disparage anybody at all. So uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Are there any more questions from the audience? Um, you're welcome to unmute your mic if you just want to speak to Julia directly. So I'm I'm going to finish up with a question then, because it sounds like your job is fascinating working with fashion brands in an area that doesn't seem relevant to construction, but you've made it quite clear how relevant it is. So what are the highlights in, in some of the work that you get to do with the fashion brands? Is there anything, it sounds quite glamorous. Is there anything like that in the role that you play? Uh no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it glamorous. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, I think when we really see uh, that the policies of uh, like a big uh, multinational company, they start to implement a policy. They start targets, and we see how many um, supply chain actors it impacts. So I say, okay, I think that's set to a better trajectory. Uh, and that's kind of something you you can feel, yeah that you've made a bit of a difference. So I think that's uh, the motivating factor of uh, working on this project. So do you think we'll ever get to the point where people who are queuing up for BAFTAs and Oscars are wearing all fashion made from cellulosic fibres? Uh, <laughs> that's that, that's a fun PR. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> it, would be, it would be a great, great achievement, wouldn't it, if we could achieve that? But yes, I, I think the, the more visibility there is, uh, of course, that shifts the minds also of, of general consumers who are following yes, social media and influencers. So it's also a very important part. Brand. Well, there we are. That's pretty well perfect for just a minute before time. So I just have time to say thank you so much to Julia Koslick for coming and speaking with us tonight. I uh, hope everyone has found that as interesting as I have. And uh, just to let everyone know that you will have a copy of the slides available uh, to download for approximately seven days, and that will include a transcript of the chat if any of those links were of interest to you. Have I missed anything out, Sarah? Brand. So thank you, Sarah, for your support, but a special thanks very much to Julia for tonight's talk. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you.